Good morning, everyone. It is good to see all of you this morning and to be together in worship today. Welcome to Cairn Christian Church. We are an open and affirming congregation, a green chalice congregation, and an anti-racism congregation in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and we do welcome all people into our space and time and community together. Especially welcome to any who are here with us as guests this morning. Invitation to the Lenten journey. This season is a journey, a journey of outward practices and inner awareness, a journey into the center of our spirits and into God's presence, a journey of confession about our longings for God and our separation from God. A journey of abiding in God, even as God abides with us, a rock that will not move, a love that is not changed. A journey with the incarnate one on his road to Calvary and with the marginalized ones who bear the crosses of oppression that exist in every time and place. A journey to be in this world, but not of this world. A journey from winter to spring, from death to life, from darkness to light, from cold to warmth, from despair to hope, from turmoil to peace, from anguish to grace. The journey is yours to make alone and ours to make together. And on this journey, bidden or not, God is present. join me in prayer um, in this prayer of gathering as I lift up this paraphrased version of a loved hymn. Gather us in spirit of love. Bring us to you in the light of this day. Call to us so that we may awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. 
We are the young, we are the old. We are all the ages in between. Help us to be alive in the mystery of you. Be with us as we take this time together to be reminded of all the wonders and beauty of this world at the same time that we acknowledge our gifts and resources so that they can be used to bring light, justice, and joy to others. Show us the way to be a light for all. Give us heart, strength, and courage to share your love, to transform the harsh injustices of this world. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bones. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. Amen.
us join together in prayer. We pray, O oh God, knowing that you are already the gift of steadfast love in every place of suffering. We pray, O oh God, because we hold these people and places in our hearts and we seek the wisdom, grace, and courage to be a presence of hope and healing be it through our gifts of money or our compassionate presence or our actions for justice. We pray, O oh God, that we might be changed when we know the suffering of others all around us. And so today we remember the eight people violently killed in Atlanta this week. Soon Chung Park, Hyun Chung Grant, Soon Cha Kim, Yong A Yu, Delena Ashley Yon, Paul Andre Michaels, Xiao Jie Tan, and Dao Young Fong. Oh God, we pray for their families and friends and communities as they mourn and find space for their anger. We pray for our nation, our world, our political and religious institutions that create and sustain racism, misogyny, anger, shame, and violence. We especially pray today for our Asian cousins and siblings and ask that their voices for justice be magnified, even as we hold them with our compassion and our love. We continue our prayers always for all who are marginalized and for the welfare of our planet when protections, rights, and benefits are systematically threatened and eroded. We pray for the suffering ones in our midst this day, those who are grieving, those who are facing disease, illness, and recovery, those who are facing tests and moves, and changes in their lives. We give thanks today for vaccinations and we also pray for the many people and places in our nation and around the world that will wait much longer than we. We give thanks for spring, springtime's slow but steady arrival for snow that waters the earth and sunlight that warms the ground. O oh God, may we see your steadfast love at work in our lives and in the life of the world. May we find wisdom, grace, and courage. May we be changed. This is our prayer, O oh compassionate one. And now hear us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our loving creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please join with me for this Lectio and Visio Divina, Divine Reading Contemplative Practice. During the Lectio, listen for the meaning of the text, and if you wish, draw or color in response. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will let, never leave me to face my perils alone. During the meditatio, ponder the words or images and listen for the voice of God. 
My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. During the oratio, open your heart to feelings and questions, and if you wish, draw or color more. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. During the contemplatio, let go of the activity, enter into a still place, breathe evenly. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. 
and I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. This morning is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their partner, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Yeah. <laughs> 
powerful it is to continue to hear Jane's voice in our worship services. It is no wonder so many people these days hate or reject religion. Seeing it as not simply a folly of the gullible, but as dangerous and oppressive. Robert Aaron Long, the shooter in Atlanta this past week who killed eight people at three massage parlors, gave as his reason his inability to control his sexual urges as demanded by God and his church. His self-loathing for this weakness turned into loathing of those he saw as a temptation and fear, shame, and anger turned to violence in a culture that provides the violent and the afflicted with the tools to do mass harm. Today, we must name the racism in this act. We must confess that as a culture and as individuals, we have not paid enough attention to the racism faced by our Asian siblings. Throughout our nation's history, but more recently since the start of this pandemic, with Donald Trump's use of the intentionally racist and inflammatory phrase, China virus. We must name the names of the victims, names that might be difficult for us to pronounce, names we might ordinarily skim over because we have not been taught to pay attention to them or learn them. Today, we must also name that men have been taught to see women as the cause of their temptations to act on sexual impulses that may or may not be healthy. And then to hate these women, even as they desire them. We must name the underlying misogyny still so rampant in our culture. Today, we must condemn a culture that refuses to put limits on access to guns tied to a second amendment that could not have understood its 21st century manifestations and to an economy built on violence. And today we must condemn all manifestations of religion that continue to traumatize individuals and communities tied as they are to passages that are the biblical equivalent of the second amendment. Texts that had a purpose in the ancient culture out of which they were born but whose repercussions in this modern scientific world, a world that understands both the body and the mind in new and more intricate ways, cause harm to the listener and to the victims of their twisted logic. An associate professor of religious studies at Skidmore College, Dr. Onishi recalled in an article this week that the evangelical culture he was raised in teaches women to hate their bodies as the source of temptation and teaches men to hate their minds which lead them into lust and sexual immortality, immorality. I would imagine that some in this worship service today were raised with those two teachings, whether you were raised evangelical or mainline Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox. 
the Crabapple Baptist Church, of which Aaron Long was a member, has taken down their website. In its place is a statement saying they are devastated by the loss of life, distraught that Aaron was a member of their congregation, that the shootings contradict his confession of faith, condemning his actions as contrary to what the church believes and deeply regretting the fear and pain caused to Asian Americans. Okay, but within this statement, they also say, he alone is responsible for his evil actions and desires. The result of a sinful heart and depraved mind for which Aaron is completely responsible a rebellion against our holy God and his word. We believe in a holy and righteous God. Apologies. Who abhors evil and will judge all sin in perfect justice. And in their statement of belief that is attached as a button at the top of this statement, they write the following. We believe that there is a radical and essential difference between the righteous and the wicked. That such only as through faith are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and sanctified by the spirit of our God are truly righteous in his esteem. While all such as continue in impenitence and unbelief are in his sight, wicked and under the curse. And this distinction holds among men both in and after death. That the wicked will be judged to endless punishment and the righteous to endless joy and that this judgment will fix forever the final state of men in heaven or hell on principles of righteousness. Aaron was taught to love God by being pure. And when he could not his church taught him that he was wicked, under the curse, and destined for endless punishment in hell. This boy and thousands of children just like him have been traumatized by their religion taught to hate themselves for failing to suppress the natural impulses of their bodies, impulses that eventually turn obsessive, addictive, destructive, and sometimes violent. Born out of shame, hopelessness, and isolation. Today we remember that sex addicts do not skulk evilly in dark corners, they are our friends and neighbors and children and parents who have been traumatized often in the crucible of religious purity. This story also needs to be told. Racism, misogyny, gun violence, religious abuse. This week in this one act, our minds and hearts and bodies have needed to react to a traumatic event that has at least these four ethical, moral complexities that raise in us all sorts of responses, some of which we can name and some of which are just circling around in us, causing responses we may not even understand. And it doesn't just happen once. In our 24 seven news cycle with automatic updates beeping in the palm of our hand and their ubiquitous presence as we scroll through Facebook innocently looking for updates on family and friends with an 
onslaught, onslaught of calls for doing justice, taking action, being informed. And with voices on various sides saying, we must focus on this side of the issue, while others demand we must focus on this side of the issue. And we're just trying to keep up and to be compassionate. And when the Atlanta shootings fade into the background of the news cycle, which they will, we will watch with loathing and also with morbid fascination for the next one. All the while we carry the impacts, the images, the debates, and the cries for our participation. We carry them in our bodies and in our hearts and in our minds. Meanwhile, the everyday run of the mill suffering of others hits us in the work that we do, in our friendships and in our homes. Unemployment, memory loss, physical disability, COVID-19, the death of a loved one, housing insecurity, microaggressions, sexual or domestic violence, our children's education on social losses this year, Suicide, overwork, climate change, disease, natural disasters, financial insecurity. What we are talking about is trauma. Trauma is simply a deeply distressing and disturbing experience. There is acute trauma, an immediate and extreme threat to someone's physical or emotional safety. There is chronic trauma, multiple long-term and prolonged trauma. And there is complex trauma, which involves multiple and varied types of trauma, usually over sustained time. What we are also realizing, however, is that there is something called secondary trauma. We are traumatized by other people's trauma and pain. It might be the pain of our spouse or a friend or a child, someone we give care to, and it might be the trauma we see daily in the media, or perhaps we work in a field that requires us to care for others who are experiencing trauma. And this year has been one big chronic trauma for the entire world, playing out in a million acute and complex ways around the globe, requiring another layer of compassion for each of us, for each other. No wonder we are exhausted. The ways we react to secondary trauma have been called exposure response, compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress disorder, vicarious traumatization, and empathic strain. And the author Laura Vandernoot has called for a response to this that she calls trauma stewardship, a way of naming and understanding how we are affected by secondary trauma and how we make sense and learn from our experiences. In her book titled Trauma Stewardship, she names 16 warning signs for secondary trauma and helps readers to understand just how many of us will recognize these in ourselves. Without being able this morning to detail each one of these, let me at least name them. Feeling helpless and hopeless because the situation is too big and overwhelming. Number two, a sense that one can never do enough, that the traumas people experience can never be assuaged 
So we work harder than ever and we can't become more desperate. Number three, hypervigilance, always in crisis mode, always in a hurry, always waiting for the worst. Number four, diminished creativity, a sense of boredom and lack of joy. Number five, the inability to embrace complexity, taking polarizing sides without hearing anything else. Number six, minimizing, as if what we are feeling is nothing compared to what others are going through. Number seven, chronic exhaustion and physical ailments. The difference between the tiredness we all feel at the end of a hard day's work and that fatigue that settles into every cell in our body. Number eight, inability to listen and deliberate avoidance of any demand on our time, our energy, our compassion. Number nine, dissociative moments, intrusive or overwhelming feelings that cause you to shut down. Number 10, a sense of persecution, feeling that we lack personal agency to transform our circumstances and that others are in charge of our lives. Number 11, guilt, that our circumstances are better than those we are caring for. Number 12, fear. Number 13, anger and cynicism, wanting revenge, not giving a damn, all at the same time. Number 14, inability to empathize and numbing our senses, wanting to shut out the hurt in a culture that provides numerous ways for us to numb. Number 15, addiction, when our numbing becomes chronic and destructive of ourselves and others. And number 16, grandiosity, this inflated sense of importance related to our work that only you have the skills and the competency needed for this crisis. That's a lot to take in. This week, we recognize that our world is filled with trauma, whether acute, chronic, or complex, and filled with traumatized people and filled with secondary trauma as we are flooded with stories of trauma, both near and far, that slowly impact our abilities to function in the world. Today, we recognize that racism is a form of trauma that misogyny is a form of trauma, that a culture that does not control gun ownership is a form of trauma, that sex addiction can both perpetrate trauma and be the result of trauma, that religion can be and is a perpetrator of trauma. And today we are called to ask ourselves as individuals, how is all of this impacting me? Where have I been traumatized? How am I living with it? Who am I caring for that is experiencing trauma? Do I have signs of secondary trauma as I care for others? Am I being a good steward of my experiences of trauma? And today we are asked, we are called to ask ourselves as a community of faith, what response can we make together to those who are living with trauma? To those who are living with secondary trauma? Are we exhibiting signs of secondary trauma in the ways we function as a community? 
Do any of our teachings cause trauma to others? And perhaps most fundamentally, how do we explain to ourselves and to others the grace and the beauty of the religious life when religion has so often been the cause of trauma? How do we enact the best of the religious life? Next week on Palm Sunday, it is to these questions that we will turn our attention. For this week, as we send our concern and our love to all who are experiencing trauma near and far, not least of all, the Asian community, and the family and friends of the shooting victims. As we listen to their stories, let us also listen to our bodies. Let us listen to our hearts. Let us listen to our minds and let us listen to our spirits. And be sure in this process to care for yourself. God has written a covenant within you, in your heart, and you are beloved. Be careful with yourself. Amen. to the I invite all of us now to lift up these gifts that we have been given. Bread and a cup filled with juice or wine. Symbols of God's love for each one of us. Symbols also of a trauma symbols of sacrifice and symbols of hope. These are the best of what our faith, our religion has to offer the world. A place where all are welcome, a place where all are loved, a place where we give of ourselves to others, even as that means we care for ourselves, a place of grace and forgiveness. Let us come to this time 
giving thanks for these gifts. Please pray with me. Loving creator, here we will drink from the cup and be reminded of your love and compassion. Here we will eat the bread and be reminded of your grace and your presence in our lives. Help us to be fully present in this moment, this astounding moment shared together and which has been shared through the ages. This time calls for us to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be strengthened, to be in the world with courage. Be with us in our daily lives and help us to know when to pause and remember the message from Jesus to love your neighbor. Amen. hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's grace is revealed to heal our brokenness, to forgive our sins, and to set each of us free from all that would oppress us. And let God's people say, Amen. Let us now go from this time, blessed by this community of faith, and blessed by God, and let us go to be a presence of peace in God's world. Amen.